Please welcome Pacific Regional Director Robin Thorson. Please welcome Pacific Regional Director Robin Thorson. Thank you for that introduction twice. <laughs> what a glorious gathering. It's hard not to shout out all the hellos that a person would want to make here because we're in a business that we not only have the privilege of having colleagues, but friends. This is really a wonderful gathering. I'm honored to be here as the regional director for the Pacific region. I've had the privilege of working in four regions in my career and the Washington office. Maybe I can't hold down a job, but I'll take a cue from Tom Melius. But instead of asking people to raise their hand about their region, I'd like you to raise your hand if you've worked near or with oceans or the marine environment. Okay, keep your hands up. Now raise your hands, those of you who have worked around water. <laughs> Our next speaker is going to talk about the land ethic extending to stewardship of oceans and all of the waters of the world. There are so many things I could tell you about Sylvia Earle. She has a distinguished academic and research credential, extensive, and it's in your program. She is a National Geographic Explorer in Residence. She has been Chief Scientist for NOAA. I want to tell you two quick anecdotes about her. She led the first team of women aquanauts in 1970 in the Tektite Project, a venture sponsored by the US Navy, NASA, and the Department of the Interior. It allowed teams of scientists to live for weeks at a time in an enclosed habitat on the ocean floor, 50 feet below the surface. That was 41 years ago. And for the considerable number of young people in the audience, I point out that before the Tektite Project, when people raved about an explorer or an aquanaut, they were talking about a man. Sylvia Earle changed that. Nine years later, in 1979, she descended in a submersible in a one atmosphere garment, carried down 1,250 feet below the ocean surface, where she walked untethered on the ocean floor at a depth lower than any living human being before or since. She described that adventure in her 1980 book, Exploring the Deep Frontier. 1980 book. Speaking of books, fast forward to 2009, when October she was on television discussing her new book, the World is Blue. That is, when she could get a word in edgewise, appearing on the Colbert Rapport. <laughs> this eminent scientist and explorer was grilled by Stephen Colbert with the query, if I can't eat fish anymore, how will I get my mercury? <laughs> she has led more than 70 expeditions, logging more than 6,500 hours underwater. She's called for a global network of marine protected areas, places she calls hope spots. But what I really think sums up Dr. Earl is a nickname I noticed on Wikipedia, her deepness. <laughs> I think the nickname fits not only because she spent more time at lower depths than nearly anyone, but also because she has helped others care about a world few will ever see. As we look at a vision for the future of the National Wildlife Refuge System, we are honored by the president's presence of this great scientist, mentor, pioneer, and world conservation leader, Dr. Sylvia Earle. What a pleasure to be here where there used to be an ocean <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> uh, 
I loved listening this morning to vision, vision, a vision for the future of the National Fish and Wildlife Service from the chief and hearing from Buddy Huffaker about the vision for a land ethic. I personally treasure my dusty copy of Sand County Almanac that I received during that same era when I first took the plunge and looked at the ocean from the inside out in the 1950s. It was during that era that Silent World was published by Jacques Cousteau, also when Rachel Carson published The Sea Around Us. That was 1951. What was not known by Otto Leopold, what was not known by Jacques Cousteau when in the 50s, or Rachel Carson, or anyone, was the magnitude of our ability to alter the nature of nature. Now we know that we have the power, we puny human beings, to alter the sky above, the fabric of life on the land and in the sea, the nature of the chemistry of the planet itself. We could not imagine going back a half a century ago, that we had that kind of potential to influence the nature of our life support system. And that's what, all things considered, the natural systems represent. It's what keeps us alive. Imagine the alternative. There it is, our sister planet. No fabric of life, no ocean. The atmosphere is largely carbon dioxide. Curiously, while some, at this point in time, long to go to Mars, and I would like to do that myself, it would be very cool to go walk around on the red planet, but we'd have to take our life support system with us. And while there is great interest in the possibility of terraforming Mars, we're doing a pretty good job of Marsiforming Earth. There's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than in the 1950s. Not as much as there is on Mars, but, you know, stand by. <laughs> what we're doing not just to the land, but to the sea, bulldozing the ocean floor in the quest for ocean wildlife. I might as well start right now by making a radical, a radical suggestion to the National Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd like to drop the fish end part, just call it the National Wildlife Service. <laughs> it's all wildlife. It is. So there's my beginning, middle, and end. <laughs> but I'll take a little more time. <laughs> just because there is so much that I would love to be able to share with you, a few images to just reinforce that, that uh, initial comment. I want to just recall that on, Earth, on Ocean's Day, the 8th of June, the new, the, that um, not-so-conservation-minded publication known as the Wall Street Journal carried an amazing piece by former First Lady Laura Bush. It was about national parks and about the ocean and about the need to protect both more of the land and of the, the waters of the world, especially looking at this country. She pointed out in this remarkable essay from the Wall Street Journal that the first national park was named not after a mountain or forest, but a mighty river, the Yellowstone. It's fitting that the first national wildlife refuge, Pelican Island, was named after another distinctively wet place. Laura Bush suggested in that little piece that what was done in the 20th century to further protection of the land should be a source of inspiration now that we are here in the 21st. In the whole world, about 12% of the land is protected with some sort of refuge, park, or wildlife preserve status. In the ocean, about 1%. Until recently, it was less than that, but some good moves have been made in recent years to up the amount of ocean that has some form of protection. For President Ulysses S. Grant created Yellowstone Park in 1872. 
That was the same year that the first major oceanographic expedition globally took place. That's when the Challenger set out from, the, from England on a four-year mission of, of, of exploration. It was a time when large wild areas on the frontier were at risk on the land in this country and around the world. Now, early in the 21st, we are looking at a time when the ocean frontier is similarly at great risk, protected heretofore by its inaccessibility, by its vastness, and by, by the belief that the land is where the action is. That has changed. It changed largely in the latter half of the 20th century, as our capacity to go further, deeper, longer, and to access places that had never known the bite of a net or a hook or the influence of humankind until this amazing point in history. All preceding history and only during our time have we begun to access these wild places in the sea. 1970s, of course, represented a remarkable time of conservation, uh, upping the ante, if you will. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and one piece of legislation not known to most people in the country or around the world was the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. At the time, NOAA was only two years old. It was in the, ironically, um, NOAA placed in the Department of Commerce, <laughs> seems an unlikely place for it to have, have landed. But whatever, this little spark of an idea of having protected areas in the sea began to get momentum in, 19, in the 1970s. Today, about 18,000 square miles of ocean in this country are protected as marine sanctuaries until 2006, when by action of President George W. Bush, two major moves were made to establish national monuments in the ocean, taking a page out of Theodore Roosevelt's book early in the 20th century, and doing for the ocean with a stroke of his pen the largest marine protected areas at the time in the world. The Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the Papahana Makuokea National Monument, 140,000 square miles of ocean with the National Fish and Wildlife Service very much a part of the action. Yes! <laughs> More change has taken place on the land, in the air, the wildlife on the land, the fabric of life and certainly in the ocean in the 20th century than during all preceding human history put together. At the same time that this change has taken place, not all of it bad, we have certainly learned things, we've learned more about the nature of the world in the same remarkable part of, of history, <laughs> but it's, it's safe to say that we have also lost more. In that same period of time, we have seen the loss of about 90% of many of the big fish in the sea. We have become so skilled at catching them. We are exploring the ocean as never before, gaining access to places that the Challenger scientists going back to 1872 to scientists in the 1950s could only dream about. Imagine having a little submarine that is so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> I'm living proof that it's possible. There are a few subs that can go to about half the ocean's depth. The United States used to be in the running, but we aren't at this point in time. Russia has two. This is one of them, mere subs that go to 6,000 meters. China is building one and testing one right now that is destined to go to 7,000 meters. India is stepping up to the plate with a plan to go to 6,000 meters plus. 
Ch um, Japan has a sub, France has a sub, that go all of them to 6,000 meters. In the whole world, though, the fleet of deep diving submersibles, whether they go to 1,000 feet, 5,000 feet, or maybe someday again back to the place where only two people have ever been, a part of the National Fish and Wildlife Service holdings, the Mariana Trench, the deepest place in the sea, <laughs> seen by only two people 51 years ago. And we don't have access to that deep trench, that slice in the bottom of the ocean. We are poised at a point where the greatest era of exploration is just beginning. Less than 5% of the ocean has ever been seen at all. We know how to exploit it. We need to do a much better job of exploring it. There's so much that we now know that we need to know. Just in October of this past year, the conclusion of a 10-year census of marine life came to pass. Census of marine life. Asking the question, who lives in the ocean? How many of what kind of creatures share space with us in the blue part of the planet? The answer, about 250,000 were finally cataloged, named by digging into records, by taking expeditions to all parts of the oceans of the world. That's probably a vast understatement of how many there actually are. Is it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times that number? We don't know. And we need to know, just as on the land, where surveys at last are taking into account not just our fellow vertebrates, as important as it is to know about the birds, the frogs, and to some extent we are paying attention to the fish, but not nearly as much as we are to our fellow mammals. Think of it, in a single gulp of a whale shark, there may be more broad categories of animal life 14 or 15 phyla floating around in the plankton than all of the land put together. That's about as many phyla as you're likely to find on all terrestrial places of animal life. 14, 15, maybe 16, depends on how you count. But most of them are in the ocean and in the bucket of water, the gulp of a whale shark, you can get a fair slice of the nature of life on Earth. We're still beginning to discover who they are. Think about some of the most common creatures on the planet, critical links in food chains that translate sun's energy into phytoplankton gobbled up by legions of some of these little guys, copepods. Now, I'm mindful that the National Fish and Wildlife Refuges are said to protect species ranging from half ounce warblers to one ton bison. Well, they also protect creatures that, far we that weigh far less than warblers and include blue whales that weigh as much as 100 tons. So think bigger and smaller. <laughs> Krill, whether in the Arctic or the Antarctic, are also middlemen in these supply chains in the ocean. Many variations on the theme of shrimp, not just those that you put on the barbie or have the so-called popcorn shrimp. The diversity of life is just staggering. We really need to think in terms of all of what Aldo Leopold refers to, the nuts, the bolts, the cogs, the wheels that make the world work. This is certainly a time of exploration. We're learning new forms of, about new forms of life. They aren't exactly new, they're just new to us. Water bears, not just the bears on the land, but those that live in moss, live in the ocean, live in sand. Deep sea corals, not just those in the sunlit portion of the ocean, but down in the great depths where sunlight does not reach. Sponges, many variations on the theme of echinoderms. And of course, our fellow vertebrates. It's logical that we should care about creatures that have the most in common with us I mean, we have backbones, turtles have backbones. Um, they have a heart, we have a heart, each of us. Uh, we, they have, we have brains, they have brains. Well, some of us have brains.
We are empathizing in some measure with our fellow mammals, the whales. They have the biggest brains on the planet, the sperm whales do. Forms of communication that we're just beginning to discover. We know about bird song. It's only in recent times that we've learned about whale song and the fact that not just marine mammals, but most fish, maybe all fish, a lot of crustaceans, many creatures make sounds and communicate with sound. They also communicate with bioluminescence. Some say the most common form of communication on the planet may have nothing to do with sound, but may have everything to do with picking up those flash, sparkle, and glowing forms of light that are common in the ocean. About 90% of the creatures in the deep sea have some form of making their own light. We still, however, think in some parts of the planet as whales, whales as commodities, whales as pieces of meat. Even dolphins are taken as, as food in some parts of the planet. For the most part, we've come to think differently about many kinds of wildlife, but we are a long way from thinking differently about fish. Fish, let me say it again, they're wildlife. And when we eat them, we should be thinking, when we take them out of the wild places, think of them as bush meat, because we didn't plant them. We're just hunters and gatherers out there. And with luck, by protecting the wild places where they live, we can continue to take some as hunter-gatherers far into the future. But taking them on a large scale, the large extractive industries that are linked to taking wildlife from the sea, we now know aren't working. With a loss of 90% or so of the tunas, the swordfish, the marlin, the sharks, groupers, snappers, they're in serious trouble. Our policies haven't caught up with them. While they do catch up, meanwhile, let's protect the places where they live and offer some safe haven somewhere in the world where these creatures can recover, restore, and provide the network of life that not just they, but we require for our existence. We have so overdone it. The methods used for the commercial extraction of ocean wildlife are destructive. Using a trawl is like using a bulldozer to catch songbirds and squirrels. Imagine how many people we could feed with songbirds, eagles, and owls. How many people can we continue to feed with ocean wildlife? We once thought that the ocean was infinite in its capacity to yield whatever we wanted to take out, and our job was go get them, go figure out how to go further, deeper, longer, with bigger nets, more boats. We are way overcapitalized, not just in this country, but in the world, with our capacity to take wildlife out of the sea, with consequences that are truly alarming. If we had techniques of this sort applied to the land today, and people could see what was happening, we might be somewhat more concerned. When I began diving years ago, I was told to look out for the man-eating sharks that were out there. And at first I worried because <laughs> man-eating sharks, but then I stopped worrying because I realized I don't qualify. But <laughs> and now we have to worry about man and woman eating sharks. I mean, millions of sharks are taken every year, partly for sport, but mostly with, to feed a new luxury or expanding luxury taste for shark fin soup. I was in Hong Kong just a couple of days ago where a thousand school kids took the pledge, I will never eat shark fin soup. I will protect sharks. It was amazing. The kids seem to get it. We have to do a better job of finding the kid in everyone to understand that there are limits to what we can take out of the wild systems, the natural systems, that keep us alive. If you do eat sushi, sashimi, tuna fish sandwiches, or whatever, please do so with great respect and realize that there are limits to what we can extract. 
and that every one of you can vote with your fork, perhaps by making other choices and understand what it takes to make a tuna fish. It takes 10 to 14 years for them to mature. We don't raise 10 to 14 year old cows or chickens or pigs. It takes a lot of water to make a cow for sure, but it takes even more water to make a tuna fish. So when I go diving in the ocean, I think about these things. What does it take to make a grouper? Maybe six years for them to mature. They may live to be 25 or 30 years. And it's the big old fish that are the best reproducers. One thing that we've discovered is that when you protect an area in the sea, just as on land, you give the critters a break. And in only two years, there are signs that there are more fish, larger fish, greater diversity of all forms of life in the ocean. It takes five years, 10 years, maybe 30, maybe 50 years for some places to begin to show the kind of recovery that is needed. When you consider that an orange roughy that lives 2,000 feet beneath the ocean and that corals that are 2,000, 5,000, 7,000 years old are destroyed in the process of taking orange roughy, then think about how much longer it will take to have protected areas in the deep sea to bring about recovery. Meanwhile, let's protect what remains. The waters around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands do have deep water corals that are now protected. And that is really good news. But it's a patch on what we need to do, considering the diversity of life that's out there. Many creatures, we don't even have names for them. But we do know, as never before, fish are wildlife. <laughs> and now, as never before, there are interests turning to mining. Now, this part of the world, right here in Wisconsin, is famous for historically, but even now, to some extent, uh, mining activities. But as we go to the ocean and realize that there, as on the land, mining takes a toll. In the Gulf of Mexico, we've been mining the fossil fuels in the deep sea with consequences that we're just beginning to account for. Cheap energy, we find, is really pricey when you put on the balance sheet some of the effects that happen when things go wrong. And again, we care about our fellow vertebrates perhaps more than some of the other creatures that are afflicted every bit as much as the obvious birds and turtles. But we need to think about the small creatures that make up the majority of life on Earth. And with respect to the price of extracting fossil fuels from the land and from the sea, it isn't just the impact on what happens when there's a spill or when a mountaintop is removed to get at the coal. Right now, increasingly, we are aware of the other cost, the cost to the nature of nature, of how the burning of fossil fuels is altering the atmosphere, altering the planetary chemistry, altering everything we care about. <laughs> what do you care about? The economy? Well. The security of the world? Well. Our health? Well. <laughs> what about life itself? All these things are on the line. For the first time in all of history, we have the capacity to know these things. We did not know in 1900. We didn't know in 1950, but now we know. We have the power to alter the nature of nature through our actions. We also have the power to take actions that can reverse the trends that threaten not just polar bears in the Arctic. Of course, they're in trouble. But if they are, we are. That's the thing. That's the message that I think permeates all that bring you to the conference here that provide the underlying theme of the vision for what is this amazingly important part of, of our country, the National Fish and Wildlife Service. What are you going to do 
in the 20th century, for the 20th century, 21st century, for the 21st century. What about the coral reefs? This picture taken by a friend is of the Great Barrier Reef as it was going back to the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up until about 1980, when this beautiful, productive, luxurious, diverse system looked like this. Coral bleaching is a phenomenon that might have happened once in a while during human history in the past, but never to the extent that it has since the 1980s. And the pace is picking up. About half the coral reefs around the world are, ne are now either gone or in a state of sharp decline. In the Caribbean, the figure is closer to 80% gone or in a state of serious decline. The good news, about half of them are still in pretty good shape. There is still time. But what about the plankton? What about the coccolithophorids, the prochlorococcus, the little blue-green bacterium that nobody knew about until about 25 years ago that contributes the oxygen in the atmosphere equivalent to about one in every five breaths you take, about 20% from one kind of blue-green bacterium. According to studies looking at the plankton over the last 50 years, 60 years, in the ocean, published last fall, since 1950, a sharp decline in phytoplankton, whose little green and blue-green engines out there in the ocean, churning out oxygen, grabbing carbon dioxide, responsible for what people are beginning to refer to as blue carbon. We do honor and respect the trees for their role in generating oxygen, grabbing carbon. Carbon credits are being given to trees. What about giving carbon credits for protecting the ocean, the blue carbon, that really generates more oxygen and grabs more carbon than the terrestrial systems? But we're only beginning to acknowledge it, let alone take action to protect it. Acidification of the ocean is another factor, another consequence of burning fossil fuels. We need to protect the blue and green engine that keeps us alive. Whatever else it is that we do, shouldn't this be a top priority? While we think about health, while we think about poverty, we think about the economy, everything, everything, everything anchors back to taking care of the natural world. If we fail to do so, nothing else really matters. I mean, do you like to breathe? <laughs> do you like the water that falls out of the sky magically? Well, everything depends on taking care of the system that keeps us alive. In the ocean as of 2008, these are the areas that had some form of protection. Little tiny specks in a vast blue realm. It has to change, really, if we are to succeed in whatever we care about, whatever our endeavors are, whatever our hopes and dreams are. Paul Krugel was outraged that the destruction of the magnificent birds of Pelican Island that led to, just as, as was put at the time, for the fleeting vanity of fashion. Well, think about how outraged we should be at the destruction of the magnificent creatures of the sea for the fleeting vanity of unsustainable luxury tastes of, for wildlife from the sea. We have a chance to think differently because now we know what our predecessors didn't know, that there are limits to what we can extract from the wild systems on the land and in the sea. The ocean clearly is the blue heart of the planet. When I'm asked, and I often am, well, how much of the ocean should we be protecting? I mean, you've got 12% of the land, is that enough? Well, no, if you want to protect the systems that keep us alive. We need, as we have in place to some extent, overarching policies such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, things that, that can permeate all aspects of our behavior. But we do need to think place-based, places that really do have some sanctity, some safe havens for the wild creatures that represent 
our life support system, safe haven for us. I like to think that all of us are sea creatures. Radical concept, perhaps, but that it, there it is, you can see it. It's home. It's the blue planet. It's at risk. There are plenty of reasons for hope. One of them is in this, this room right now. Actually, there are several hundred reasons for hope in this room right now. Jane Goodall, in her book, Reasons for Hope, gives four principal reasons why she's an optimist in the end. One, the human mind. We can see what no other creature on the planet can see. Think about all those creatures that live as long as we do, whales, turtles. But they may know that the world has changed in their lifetime, but they don't know why, and they don't know what to do about it. We do know why, and we do know what to do about it. The second reason is the human spirit. We have the capacity to go beyond the usual, to make giant leaps of faith, giant leaps that, that transcend science, although we certainly need the science. We need the knowing that leads to caring, the caring that leads to action, and action that leads to hope. The third big reason that Jane Goodall gives is the resilience of nature. That's really good news. Protect an area, there's hope. You can go too far. There were monk seals in the Gulf of Mexico up until 1952, as far north as Galveston represent their former range. There are monk seals, a different species, but it, there are monk seals in the Mediterranean Sea, and now the few that remain in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, protected by you, thank you. <laughs> but in the Gulf of Mexico, there is no hope. That resilient part of nature ran out, and it's happening all around us with extinction, extinction, extinction. Creatures we will never get to know, never even name, let alone understand their place in the machinery that keeps us alive. But the fourth reason is perhaps the best reason. Reason for hope, making peace with nature, starts with making the kids of the world connect with nature in ways that seem more natural 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. Today, the disconnect between the wild and people everywhere is a serious issue. My solution, no child left dry. <laughs> Actually, I tell kids, that they are a part of the luckiest generation. With all the doom and gloom, and there's plenty of it around. As never before, we, unique among all the creatures on the planet, know we have a problem, and we know what to do about it. Going back 50 years ago, we were blissfully ignorant of the magnitude of our capacity to alter the nature of nature. 50 years from now, the options that we now have available to us may have slipped away. At least, it will be harder to put in place those actions that we now can take. Ed Wilson, on his 80th birthday, just a couple of years ago, said, we're letting nature slip through our fingers. But the flip side of it is the really worrisome part. It's nature letting us slip through her fingers. Our ability to alter the nature of the world so that the planet becomes inhospitable for the likes of us, that's what should be focusing our attention as never before, because as never before, we didn't know. Now we know. As never again, we have a chance to do something about it. I love the part of the vision that is articulated in the material that's now being circulated for the future of the agency represented here. Doing the right thing in the right place. You can add to that at the right time. Now is that time. 
this little piece of time that you are considering how to shape the 21st century, how to shape the next 10 years, perhaps the most important time in the next 10,000 years. Thank you.